I'm Rob Lapurio, Senior Editor at Gold Derby, here with Anthony Willis, composer for Saltburn. Um, Anthony, writer-director Emerald Fennell says you truly delivered on um, something incredibly sexy for the score. And I really would love to hear from you. Uh, talk me through that vision for the film and its music. Wow, okay, right in there. So <laughs> yeah. I think the first thing Emerald really wanted was to capture the sense of the house and Saltburn and the gothic, the gothic aspect. And you know, she she said to me right right at the beginning, she said, Anthony, there aren't enough scores with organ. It's the best instrument ever. So so a lot of it was about, you know, capturing this kind of classical world that Oliver wants to wants to fit into and he doesn't. And you know, and throughout the film he goes on a journey through kind of loneliness and you know romance and lust. So when it came to the lust, um, Emerald, you know, really liked the idea of some kind of visceral, subverted, you know, something lower that would, would give you that kind of throbbing, <laughs> throbbing feeling. And we talked about the idea of, you know, after, you know, after you've had a night out, you know, somebody's still partying and, you know, at least when we we're all younger, <laughs> somebody's still partying and you can kind of hear through the, the floorboards of the bedroom, a kind of the afterglow of like a, a sort of synthy, you know, synthy dance music or party music. So it was my challenge to go, okay, well, how can we do that, but actually make it bespoke to this Gothic world and this world of organs. So I took an, um, I took an organ. We actually recorded it in Tumble Church in London, which was a lot of fun to do. Um, hard, hard to get in there because from, you know, their point of view, they're kind of like, films we don't need films or there's a church that's been here for hundreds of years you know the Templar Knights are buried there so um and then I put it through a dance um you know sent an LFO plugin that gave it that kind of visceral uh throb and um so that was the essence of it and then you know added like harp like way below its right like it's just at the bottom of its range that gives you that kind of visceral visceral idea obviously we associate harp as such a a beautiful instrument but when you take it way out of its um out of its zone that that it's, it's a really interesting kind of visceral color that i like a lot and um yeah and then you know adding sort of a, a cello quartet that just sort of has this 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 longing and this wanting and that's what's so cool about what emerald's done with this film is that you know there's the side of us that we really want to show everyone and then you know what she does is she kind of she picks apart scenes where she's like, I'm going to show you something that people don't normally show of themselves, you know, the, the longing and the wanting. So yeah, it was a lot of fun, but it, it was really about fitting that sound into the kind of the overall architecture of the score. Yeah, because it is a really varied score. Um, and you've also got to, you're also interplaying with the amazing needle drops on this film. I, it's, it felt like a soundtrack to my days at university. Um, and uh, I, I just wondered then, is that a challenge as well? Do you have to, in your mind, match or be consistent with the different songs that are being employed in the film? Or are you quite free to do something um, on your own and just worrying more about the story? No, Emerald, I mean, one of the many reasons Emerald's so wonderful to work out with is she she's such a musical egalitarian she she loves music from you know she loves choral music she loves organ music she loves like really cool party music and and absolutely like that was the goal with the soundtrack itself was to evoke those kind of college days and the kind of songs we would we'd be hearing one of the first assignments she gave me which isn't related to the original score but it was that there's a, a really cool track Lon loneliness where Oliver gets lost in the maze and she said, yeah, I just don't want to play through the song here. I want to, I want to twist it into, into score. Um, and so I did a, a string piece that takes over and, you know, it's kind of got Gothic arpeggio similar to a lot of the score. So that's, there is that kind of meeting point, but they are, they do, you know, they do, um, they do sort of fulfill different, purposes you know the, the soundtrack is very much to evoke that nostalgia and the score is to steer us on Oliver's journey through you know through these different different things that actually kind of 
for people who've seen the film will know that the idea is it's sort of steering you away from certain things. That was a big, big part. Of it was actually the structural role of the score. So that it, yeah. it steered you, you know, steered you to what you're supposed to understand about this character's motivations. And then ultimately the end, everything is hidden in plain sight. Exactly. And in fact, that was my next question because I wondered whether there was much temptation or whether you were constantly pairing back from telegraphing Oliver's true motives and agenda in scenes between him and Felix, or was it more always about being in the moment and and really am, amplifying that magnetic connection between them in that moment, regardless of what he was trying to do? I think one of the things that, that Emerald loves exploring about people is that we don't always just want one thing. We, we often want lots of things and our motivations shift depending on what, what we experience. And certainly in terms of playing with the audience with that, um, yeah, she very much, it was very important to kind of stay in the moment and, you know, keep, keep, keep us guessing. I mean, Saltburn is a, you know, it's a, it's a big maze. So the idea was this, it's a, it's a puzzle and you kind of write when you get to the end of it, it all kind of comes, you put all the pieces together. So yeah, and that, and that was a really fun part of it. And it's, it's challenging the psychology of that for sure. Um, and obviously the performances are phenomenal. So you're kind of really living off that and the cinematography is just so beautiful. So it was uh it was a real blast. Yeah. Um, I'm also, I, I want to talk a little bit more about some of the tracks in particular. Um, we, we were talking earlier about that EDM angle. Uh, Felix Amica is an uplifting track that features that melodic, those melodic house elements paired back a little with that kind of throbbing, um, relentless vibe to it. I, I find it really hard to explain, but I loved it and I thought it paired so beautifully with all those mid noughties deep cuts. Um, did that come to you relatively quickly once you got the concept of what it wanted, what you wanted it to sound like? That was a really interesting one, and 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 yeah, and I should have I should have mentioned that in my answer earlier about the kind of bridge between the score and the, and the songs. In that, Emerald uh, originally envisaged that as a song piece, but uh, Victoria Bradal, the brilliant editor, had cut it in this, this really interesting time lapse montage that had a lot of dialogue. So Emerald said hey can you write a piece that, that that sounds that evokes the kind of thing that they would have been partying to but that is still score and it's it's essentially a friendship uh it's a friendship montage and but i but i put you know i infused it with those kind of classical um arpeggios that are sort of again this language that oliver wants to possess but then you know but in this case it's taken into like more of a fun fun party track so you know i, I think it's really fun to push and try and try and do something that's a little different and you know see where you can thread that line across lots of different different musical needs yeah and then of course you um you really lean into that gothic horror gothic romance which is maybe the same thing um uh, on tracks like a shared bathroom and the maze where um you know i'm going to explain this in my layman's terms but like you used stretched out strings, pensive kind of percussive strings, and then these rapidly descending chords that um, elicit a sense of unease and mystery. And um, I'm just wondering whether that kind of music comes quite easily to you or was that something that you really had to work on quite hard? I think we all work as hard as we can on everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it, for me, what Emerald wanted for that particular, for the maze, was I was a I was a chorister in England um, when I was younger, and obviously the, the film really pushes into this sort of English um, English style. So it, it's really supposed to play like a, a mournful hymn with a with a sort of horrific ass, angle to it. But it's a it's a mournful it's mourning mourning loss, and and you know hopefully this isn't too spoilery. But yeah, it's 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 deeply mournful, and then ends with a solo treble. You know on on his own that was you know for me that was lovely because i was kind of pulling into that core background that i have and yeah the the, the romance of it was was really important and, and again i tried to do it in a kind of classical way where oliver's oliver's theme is you know at the forefront um and, and threaded throughout 
Yeah. Um, and I think you used the perfect word earlier. And a lot of what he's doing and what you're doing is about this longing, um, this yearning. And uh, yeah, and I just think it comes so comes through so beautifully through your music. Thank you, Anthony, for your time today. We'll bring you back shortly for our group chat. Thank you so much.